but uh, I don't want to get into that. Let me get into folks who can help us to explain this, uh, folks like Jeff Larson and Peter Nicholson. So moving forward, Jeff and Peter have teamed up to become a powerhouse on policy thought leadership in Nova Scotia, Canada, uh, and beyond. Jeff's background is a lawyer, entrepreneur, senior civil servant, and currently the lead for the Creative Destruction Lab, or CDL, uh, Creative Destruction Lab Atlantic, and executive director of innovation and entrepreneurship at Dalhousie, gives him a unique perspective on the economy in Nova Scotia. And Dr. Nicholson has served in numerous posts in government, business, science, and higher education. His public service career included positions as head of policy in the office of the Prime Minister of Canada, as a member of the Nova, and as a member of the Nova Scotia Legislature. Business leaders and governments turned to their recent COVID-focused guide titled A Smart Testing Strategy to con uh, Control COVID-19 in Canada in their approach to policy. And Jeff and Peter will give their perspective on uh, what needs to be done and what can be done to make our economy reopen safely. We must continue to find the balance between, between public health and economic well-being, and they'll share, the thought, share their thoughts on how well we're doing in Nova Scotia and what more can be done. Welcome, Jeff and Peter. And I see your smiling faces there. Thank you. <laughs> there you are. Well, I see Jeff. I don't see you. Well, and I see Peter. OK. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks, Patrick. Look, we're going to do a tag team here. And uh, I'll start off. Uh, we basically got two themes. First, we're going to say a little bit about getting to a safe reopening. But given uh, the remarks of Janet De Silva a moment ago, I don't think we really have a whole lot more to add to that. Uh, so most of the presentation is going to be in what we've called here step two, preparing for the new normal. And we're going to really go beyond preparation for the new normal and describe uh, an agenda for a lot of things that can and should be done uh, really to continue the momentum established at the time of the of the Ivany report. And it's a momentum that I think has, has, uh, is well underway in Nova Scotia, has served the province well. But let me start first by saying a few things about where we are now in terms of the virus. Um, no Nova Scotia really should be proud of itself. And it's, it's hard to remember that given the alarm that we've experienced in the last few weeks. But still bear in mind that on a per capita basis, on, by any metric, essentially, uh, Nova Scotia and Atlantic Canada are still one of the safest jurisdictions in the world. That is not to rest on any kind of laurel, but it does mean that contact tracing can still work in our jurisdiction. The infection rate is still low enough, and we certainly want to keep it there. But what we have learned is that the virus that causes COVID-19, the so-called SARS-CoV-2, is a very persistent and stealthy invader. So we have to do more than we have been doing. And in that regard, I'm just gonna spend one slide talking about uh, rapid testing, which was something that you and Janet were discussing just a few moments ago. So first, let me just run through these bullets because they describe the, the logic behind uh, our proposal to, uh, to implement ultimately uh, at least a half a million tests a day across Canada. And I should say that our expert advisor on public health in the paper that we've written is Dr. Vivek Goel, who was just mentioned a moment ago. And by the way, who has just become the, the president of uh, the president of the University of Waterloo. Anyway, the, the testing so far until very, very recently is focused on diagnosis. And that's those who already have symptoms or their close contacts. But the key thing about this virus is that roughly 40% of the transmission is from people who don't present symptoms at all, either because their symptoms haven't developed or because they go through the whole course of the infection without ever having uh, significant symptoms. And consequently, they don't uh, take the necessary measures to isolate themselves from other people. And so really, we have to identify more and more of these invisible spreaders. And that requires some kind of a screening testing strategy, not simply 
a diagnostic one, which applies when you're already sick or if you've been in contact with someone who is. Now, screening <laughs> requires a massive increase in testing, far more than we're used to. Uh, but of course, it can't be absolutely universal. You still have to focus it in areas where we know the risk is elevated. Uh, and I could go into that, but we clearly don't have time. Now, fortunately, there's a, there is a new technology, a testing technology called an antigen test, which has two advantages over the classic diagnostic test, the so-called PCR test. And the antigen tests are extremely inexpensive, just a few dollars a dose, and very, very fast, uh, probably about 15 minutes. So this is a technology that is suited to the kind of massive screening that we've uh, advocated in our paper. Uh, of course, it's not quite as accurate as the PCR test, so that remains as the backup to confirm positive antigen tests. And I'm very pleased to see that Nova Scotia has started to implement some of these on a so-called pop-up basis, and I believe the province has acquired about 60,000 of these tests, and Canada has ordered 20 million to be delivered over the next two or three months. Um, so I think I would expect that as soon as the public health officials are confident that they have a handle on how this test works, that we'll see a rapid rollout to those places and locations where risk is elevated. And there's two purposes in this. One is obviously to detect more of these silent spreaders uh, and therefore to get a better handle on the spread of the disease period but the other is to really increase confidence. And that was the main point that was made uh, in, the, in Janet's presentation a few minutes ago. So, so th just three things to add to that. One is that uh, there is a Nova Scotia company came out of a, a lab at St. Evex and now doing work with Dow that has developed an antigen test called Sona Nano uh, based in Dartmouth. And uh, they're currently going through the Health Canada process. Secondly, the per capita allocation of half a million tests for Nova Scotia would be about 14,000, just to give you a, a sense of scale. Now, because there's so much less uh, prevalence in Nova Scotia than there is in the rest of Canada, you probably wouldn't do one on a per capita basis. You're probably looking at more like five or six or 7,000 uh, that you would do with our current level of testing, but it's still a, a, a dramatic increase from what we're doing right now. And third, I think, uh, you know, in our, paper with Vivek and his expertise, we've tried to outline uh, circumstances where you might do an antigen test, uh, the higher risk areas, the travel borders, um, high risk work environments. Um, that is, is really just a, uh, a, a, an idea that needs to be informed by further uh, input. For example, the focus on testing bar staff seems like a very sensible approach given what the public health experts were seeing. Thanks, Peter. Okay, great, Jeff. Thank you. Um, okay, the uh, so now we're into into step two, which is going to be a long step. Uh, this is going to be a marathon, not a sprint. Um, and what we've outlined here, and we'll elaborate in the next several slides, is uh, uh, an agenda for the province under six theme areas. Uh, the first is to develop and acquire talent. Now, this has been said many times, but it can't be said often enough because ultimately it is any society's most valuable resource. Uh, secondly, we have to uh, embrace and continue to deepen our involvement with the digital transformation, which is really the next industrial revolution. And we're really only at the very beginning of it. And the digital transformation really is infusing absolutely every aspect of both economic and social life. Uh, so this is not something we can afford to be laggards in. Uh, a key application of that uh, is in the healthcare field, which is both, of course, expensive for jurisdictions, but crucial to a population that is aging. And I think there's a great deal of advantage in, a, in an area like Nova Scotia and Atlantic Canada more generally, where we have a substantial rural population, where we have an advanced healthcare knowledge development system to really 
become among the North American leaders uh, in digital and virtual healthcare uh, to get ahead of the future because this is coming. Uh, next, of course, is, is, is climate change, which is uh, the other crisis on a completely different time scale from COVID, but frankly, more profound in the long run. And it's not only to prepare uh, to do our part in the battle against climate change, which is going to be a global fight for as long as any of us live, but also there are opportunities if you're early enough and smart enough to profit from it. Uh, the, the fifth theme is, uh, involves a, a new word, local hood, but it's something I think we're learning as a result of the COVID experience that uh, we've, we've come to know our own local environments and to appreciate them much greater than, than we otherwise probably would have. I mean, it's a, it would waste a crisis if we, didn't, if we didn't get some new insight from it. And I think this is a concept in which Nova Scotia has some very specific advantages. And, and finally, but of course, by no means least, uh, we have to continue to catalyze innovation because innovation, which is, which is more than tech and industrial uh, invention and what have you, it really is the ultimate source of both social and economic value. And uh, without innovation, every, every society can only stagnate or, or fall backward. Now, under each of these headings, we've got five or six different uh, action items. So this is really quite a long agenda. I counted them up, Jeff, and there's about 32 items. So we're only going to be able to touch them at a very, very high level. But I think it is a good, it, it's a good practical action-oriented agenda, not all of which can be done uh, now or next year or even the year after. This is a program uh, to continue, as I said earlier, Nova Scotia's momentum which was well established after the Ivany report and to continue that momentum uh, for decades ahead. So, Jeff. so to give you an idea of the type of ambition that we're talking about, um, early childhood education, double down on that and go even earlier, super important for inclusive innovation uh, and, and a variety and, and workforce participation of different groups in the workforce. Expanding, there's something called Nova Scotia Virtual Schools, which has been in existence for a while. And this gives us an opportunity to really expand that and ensure the quality of education that may exist in some parts uh, and the programming, including things like trade skills programming and others, can reach all corners of the, of the province. Um, we're suggesting, let's go all in on, on talent. Um, having skills beyond high school is gonna be extremely critical. We have a Nova Scotia Community College system where everybody's an hour away from one. Let's eliminate tuition for Nova Scotia residents. And many of those programs, over 70 of them, you get actually university credits. And so for people who, who go this pathway, maybe even uh, support their, their continued education beyond that. Micro-credentialing is uh, a, a rising uh, need where people need to demonstrate beyond just what they're learning in schools that they have certain skills that are useful for uh, for employers. And so there's a, a, an urgent need to make sure that we uh, recognize and support and encourage those kinds of skills to be developed by our youth uh, and, and then to be able to be used by, by, the, by the employers. Um, we need to keep the gas pedal on uh, increasing our share of provincial nominees. Uh, for a while, Manitoba was getting uh, five or six times more nominees than Nova Scotia. And the challenge, I think, was that Nova Scotia has to prove that we can absorb them and, uh, and, and benefit from them. And we have more than done that. There's been a tremendous amount of work by everyone from the chamber and the uh, various organizations like the Y and ISANS uh, and the province to do that. Um, and then we have an idea that we've uh, used about um, very specific, almost like when we go and recruit uh, through NSBI specific companies to move to Nova Scotia, to go and recruit those very successful and, and uh, driven entrepreneurs who, um, if with, with research, you can realize don't want to be in California anymore, don't want to be in large city centers, want the benefits of Nova Scotia, that local hood we're going to talk about. 
And let's focus on getting 25 or 50 of them who will have outsized impact on, uh, on the province. With digital transformation, um, you know, finish the job ASAP on universal broadband. This is table stakes. This is, you know, a basic necessity at this point. Um, and whether that means, you know, looking to Starlink and the satellite services to plug the gaps um, uh, to double, uh, double our efforts uh, or not, you know, that's the kind of ambition we need. Um, there is this digital divide and in a real need for every student to have access to Chromebooks, not just occasionally at school, but at home. So we're suggesting free pro Chromebooks for students in grade seven and 10. This has been piloted. And surprisingly, after four months, I think the, the stat I heard was one was lost and one was damaged out of uh, an entire school. Um, we're suggesting double the enrollment capacity of computer science degrees and certificate programs across the, the post-secondary institution. And there's a program that was launched uh, under Obama called Tech Skills, where uh, industry would say, you know, if you can graduate people with a six month credit in these technical disciplines, we'll guarantee hiring them. We're suggesting uh, uh, replicating that program, which was very successful. And somewhat building off what um, we, we just heard from Janet about a, a technology adoption program that she mentioned, there was one delivered by the National Research Council, which delivers IRAP, called the Digital Technology Adoption Program, which had enormous success and, and, uh, and a, a very good um, uh, post-mortem on its uh, outcomes, but um, it, it wasn't a program that was continued at, at the time as I think there was a change in government. Um, it was many years ago, and that type of program is the kind that we think is needed for small, medium-sized businesses. Peter? Okay, uh, well, here's a, here's a mega application of what Jeff was just talking about, and that is the digitization and the virtualization of healthcare. Uh, I think it's important when we talk about this to recognize that there are two different objectives here. One is obviously better and more inclusive care, but there also is a new economic opportunity for Nova Scotia because there are a lot of innovative companies in the province in, uh, involved in, in the leading edge of healthcare and various uh, niche technologies. Uh, so there's, there's really a two-pronged benefit to uh, promoting a digital health agenda. Uh, now the, the table stakes for this one is to have the electronic health record of every individual to be treated as an absolute top priority. I know there's been a lot of work in developing this over time, but that needs to be uh, supercharged. Uh, because without data, digital health, uh, the digital health agenda doesn't really get off the ground. And so that leads to the next bullet, which is the importance of working with other Atlantic provinces to create the protocols needed for health data sharing, uh, not surprisingly, there's a lot of incompatibility across provincial borders, and that has to be accompanied by adequate privacy assurance. And the reason why that's so important is that you need in this field large databases, which means a large population. Now, Nova Scotia has roughly a million people, but in Atlantic Canada, we've got 2.6 million. So it's important to expand the reach of of, uh, of a data to, en to encompass at least those four provinces. Ultimately, we want these protocols to be extended across the country. Now, the next, and this has been so underlined by COVID, is the importance of building up our public health infrastructure. And uh, the truth is that public health has been the poor child of the healthcare system across the country for years now. And Nova Scotia, uh, according to the data that we've been able to see from uh, from the federal from federal sources, uh, has really had the weakest performance in public health infrastructure investment over the past uh, ten or fifteen years. So there's an opportunity here, given the, uh, the the demonstrated need as a result of COVID, to really almost have a greenfield reset of our public health system. And as Janet De Silva said, uh, that is ripe for digitalization. And once again, the importance of data and the application of, of uh, new 
software technologies uh, in the artificial intelligence uh, portfolio. Um, <clears throat> then uh, there's, there's still, I shouldn't say still, there's an enormous opportunity for digital health applications applied to rural areas. I mean, it goes beyond telehealth uh, as the broadband connections become more and more capable. And also, Jeff, and you might want to say a word or two about this, there's some really interesting technology that can be applied in our long-term care homes and other area which was highlighted. So why don't you tell us a yeah, little just bit. Just quickly, one of our companies that we had in uh, Creative Destruction Lab over the summer is we had a special program globally on, um, on uh, responses to COVID was a company that was incubated through Shanex. It's a startup uh, by some successful founders, two of which were co-founders of Kinduct, which was recently acquired. And these founders developed a, a tracing technology. Initially, it was meant to protect staff and other residents from, um, uh, from somebody who might have dementia or might be at risk to themselves or others. And they can uh, micro position the person um, with extraordinary detail and also report it to love, uh, loved ones at home so that they know that people are actually getting um, support and care from, from their uh, caregivers in, in, in long-term care facilities. Quickly, they realized that this was also uh, useful in, uh, in if there's been a, a case in an elderly home to track who else that person has been in contact with. Um, so this company is a homegrown company um, it, it, and just uh, shooting, shooting to the moon right now uh, with opportunity, both in their core original market, but this other opportunity. And that's the kind of thing that we have tremendous opportunity to. And we have three or four other kind of senior tech care companies that are equally impressive. Peter. Okay, thanks. Well, look, uh, let's skip on to the next one. I'm sure. Conscious that time is <laughs> fleeting. Um, take the climate change uh, challenge seriously and profit from it. Well, 87% uh, of this province's greenhouse gases come out of three sectors, electricity, generation, transportation, and buildings, not surprisingly. Uh, I think probably the most exciting opportunity here is with respect to battery technology. Uh, for the simple reason that we've already got uh, a world-class company, uh, Novonics, and we have absolutely world-class intellectual resources in the Tesla chair at Dalhousie at Jeff Don. So there's a tremendous opportunity to build here on an industry that is going to be huge in the future. Um, in addition to which, of course, at the, at the, at the level of, of individuals and businesses, uh, we do need to greatly expand uh, our renewable opportunity and uh, that really means solar wind and particularly heat pumps for buildings both residential and commercial uh, the problem there is the upfront cost even though the life cycle cost of these technologies definitely is better than the alternative but there is a there is a bit of a sticker shock problem at the beginning so what's needed there and uh, and i think it's probably going to be uh, not beyond their capacity, given how low long-term interest rates are, to develop financing schemes uh, to support the massive uh, rollout of these technologies. So, uh, Jeff, why don't we go on to the next one? Because uh, sure. So I think everyone has stories now of uh, people moving into their neighborhoods or uh, in their cottage areas uh, from Toronto and Vancouver and New York. Uh, and that's because there's going to be a large number of people who don't prefer to work downtown uh, in those office towers that uh, Janet desperately wants to get people back to. They're, they'll still continue to have a role, but there's a ton of talent that wants to be in a place that is interesting with some culture, with some restaurants, with easy access to the outdoors. Um, and that's both Halifax. I think Halifax will be the biggest winner. If you look at any mid-sized city in Canada, you know, I think Victoria is nice, but, you know, there's nothing else in our league, um, to be honest, um, the Waterloos and Guelphs and others. Um, and, uh, and even for the rural areas, you know, if you could be within an hour or two of Halifax, there's people who will prefer that. So this is a massive talent play. Um, and talent is going to want to be here. Now, there's a variety of things we're going to have to do to uh, make the, to enhance what 
assets we have there, uh, including around transportation, uh, uh, active uh, networks like biking and hiking, so on and so forth. Um, one of which is innovative affordable housing. Um, my concept here is to use the CDF structure, which is a community economic development investment funds where uh, investors, Nova Scotia investors will get up to 65% in tax credits. Usually that's not applicable for real estate as a passive investment because there's no market failure there. It's usually meant for uh, active businesses and like tech and things like that. But there is a market failure in affordable housing. And this would increase the investment and supply of affordable housing, um, which we desperately need to do. Uh, and then other things are, you know, ensuring we have micro lending uh, uh, kind of programs and things like that to support local food and the local recreational and other assets that are critically important for talent. Um, these things have an outsized impact on our ability to attract and retain talent. And we are ripe to be leading, not just in Canada, but in North America and the world for a place that people want to be. But we have to actually invest in it now and refine some of the rough edges. And finally, catalyzing in innovation. Is this one myself or you, Peter? Yeah, no, that's you. Okay. <laughs> um, in this world of, um, uh, you know, our view is that the critical thing for attracting companies to come here is talent. If we have the talent and we demonstrate we have it, they will come. So we think we need to evolve our foreign direct incentive uh, structure from payroll rebates, which subsidize uh, payroll, to something like an innovation voucher where they might get the same equivalent value, but it's used to invest in talent, um, in procurement from innovative companies locally, where it's used essentially to create a stickier environment between the companies here and there. And that's why we also think the previous things we talked about investing in talent are actually probably the most important thing that we need to do. Doubling the amount of computer science students we have is gonna have an outsized impact on, on foreign direct investment compared to payroll rebates and subsidies. Um, we think uh, there's been a trend towards our innovation investments um, uh, from in seed and venture capital from public uh, entities to private ones. Um, like build ventures and concrete ventures. We need to continue to do that as the ecosystem matures. And we think we should expand the ocean supercluster model to smaller, what we call proto or early stage clusters in agri-food, clean uh, slash batteries and, and health. And then finally, uh, building on what uh, Janet said once again, she was, uh, she was on the ball. Uh, we had a concept that uh, the Atlantic Growth Advisory Group, which was led by um, Henry Damone and included uh, uh, some, some other business leaders from Atlantic Canada on a SME export accelerator. And I'm going to share some of the information with Patrick as well, because seeing how uh, the Toronto Chamber has championed something like this, uh, I think it would be worthwhile for uh, the Halifax Chamber to look at as well. And that's, that's the end of our presentation. Wow. Well... As usual, you guys have given us an awful lot to think about. <laughs> uh, in fact, an awful lot to think about. Let, let, me, let me come up with a couple of simple questions to pump problems. Uh, do we have the money to do all of those things? Yeah, you know, some of our programs that we suggest would be shifting money, for example, from payroll rebates to something else. Um, absolutely. Um, the investment in early childhood education and those types of activities, um, you know, it's been shown, uh, you know, first of all, one of the ways that was funded last time was uh, through um, other savings that were found in the education system. Um, so we always have to be focused on that. Um, and but the long term payoff over oh, is just every economics uh, report shows that the payoff is there. Um, digital health, it's just an imperative. Like, we're going to either keep paying more and more for worse care, or we're going to invest in digitization and far better care with greater reach to rural areas for less money. Like, it's just, you know, that's just the way it is. So, um, interest rates are at an all time low. It is the time, I think, to think about investing and um, not, you know, running up unsustainable deficits for no return. But it's a time to make really smart investments, and the payoffs are there. We're, we're, we're very confident. Peter? Yeah, just, just two things. First of all, this is a long-term plan, obviously. <laughs> we're not talking about this in the next year or two. 
Secondly, a lot of the uh, public sector investment will, will be helped along by the federal government. And as Jeff said, I think supercharged by low interest rates at this time. And also when you go through all of these bullet points, you'll see that a great many of them also are going to have to be financed by the business sector itself be, for the very reason that these genuinely are investments with a payoff. Right. Well, and I, and I think you're absolutely right. I mean, I think there will be money from the federal government over the next little while. There is an incentive to do things differently, although because there's an incentive, we need to take advantage of that incentive as a province, uh, I think, to, uh, to really do things differently and to take advantage of what, is, what are new systems. I want to back up for a minute. Uh, I know because Jan kind of talked about what was going on in Toronto, we didn't talk a lot about um, some of the, the work that you, you folks have done in the last six months, I suppose. Um, you know, back in July and August, you wrote about kind of the walled garden that we could establish in Nova Scotia. We could have some freedom in Nova Scotia. To some extent, that came true. We did do that. The one thing I think we didn't do, which I believe has kind of got us into this situation today, is we never implemented testing at the airport um, to actually qualify some of the folks that are coming in. It worked out for months and then suddenly it didn't work. And when it doesn't work, it doesn't work bad, you know, quickly. So I, I guess I'm just, if you could reflect a little bit on maybe, I'm not asking you what we could do right or what we could do wrong, but if we're gonna get out of this current lockdown and where you could reflect on what you said before, is, time, is it time for testing at the airport at this point to kind of create that walled garden? Well, yes, certainly in, in, it was time before, but look, in fairness to the, to what government was faced with, frankly, I think they've done an amazing job. And we all tend to underestimate what looks great and easy on paper and <laughs> what is extremely difficult to do in practice in a very short time when your house is more or less on fire at the same time. And unfortunately, that's a bit of the problem that we're in right now. But it's one of the reasons why I'm so pleased to see that the province is now trialing these rapid tests, which frankly, there was some skepticism of, understandably, because they're not as accurate. But I don't think that the accuracy problem is that serious in, 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 at the stage of an infection where the person is, in, is contagious. Because at that point, the viral loads are quite high and these rapid tests are not that much less accurate. So yes, I think that we've got a chance to reset on that one, and it's going to be important for confidence building as well. Right, and, and I would agree with you. I mean, the house is on fire today. We had Dr. Strang on a call yesterday. Um, no one's suggesting we do it today, but I think tomorrow, uh, or <laughs> now, uh, I think is probably a time, and we could do PCR testing. I mean, I like the rapid testing idea but we could do PCR testing as Calgary is doing. Um, yeah. I'm gonna have to cut us off there. Sure. Uh, I apologize, but I, I really thank you very much, Peter and Jeff. You, you've actually given me a lot more to think about than I thought. I thought sure. we we're gonna kind of focus on, on where we were and you've now gone to a whole new level. So I've got to catch up yet again. <laughs> yeah, I think we could spend more than an hour on every one of these 32 bullets. So yeah, well, there we've got, we've got a course for the next year. <laughs> exactly. No, no, I, I, think it's, I think it's great information. And I think, I think you guys need to build some advocacy with folks like the Chamber and some other groups to actually encourage people to do some of these things, because I think we would like to do that. Yeah. Um, and, and our rates are very low. Perfect. <laughs> we're just a little not for profit. Right? We're, we're a zero revenue not for profit. <laughs> so thanks, Patrick. That was great. Thank you very much, Peter. And thank you, Jeff. Really appreciate it. Speak to you soon. Yeah, bye now. Thank you. Bye bye. Okay. Uh, well, that was great. Thank you very much, Jeff. And thank you, Peter. Uh, we really appreciate your leadership during this time. And, and, uh, and the information that you were able to, uh, to provide us with.